Director of Development from the, fire, from the Farm 41, who will tell us something, some story and experience about his project. So let's greet him with applauses. Nice. We got four personal, one of them which is I'm working with. But okay. <laughs> Better to have free interested people than, than crowd of uh, bored ones. Okay. Uh, I will do short post-mortem of our Chernobylite game. It won't be very deep because there is no time for that. We got only 30 minutes, but uh, I will try to slide through different aspects of uh, how this project has been made since the very beginning, before we even started to think about this project and until we have finished. In the meantime, you can interrupt me with any questions because I guess there won't be much time for question and answers later. So, at the Farm 51, we have been mostly focusing on first-person shooter games for PC and consoles. We never did uh, mobile games. Uh, we did some handheld games back in time and uh, in general, this is what we are keeping doing like PC plus consoles. And uh, today, at our company, we got like three main projects, a Chernobylite, World War Three, and Chernobyl VR project. Uh, I will mention mostly uh, Chernobylite and Chernobyl VR project because they are related. World War Three is totally separate entity. It's being done by different team and just technically it's under the same company. But uh, me personally, I'm not involved into this project at all. So genesis of Chernobylite project was that we had two previous uh, creations. One of them was Get Even. It was a game which was a kind of walking simulator mixed with action elements. Uh, deep story, deep narrative, uh, quite, let's say, innovative technology. We were one of the first who were using photogrammetry on a very big scale. For this game, the only thing was that this game was not successful. Like it, it, it was well received. It had good reviews, both from uh, press and from the players. But it didn't succeed commercially for different reasons. Uh, a bit of marketing, a bit of this game was very hard to uh, to classify. This game was very hard to to get into like it was demanding for the players and it required a lot of attention it was simply not easy game uh, and not, not in terms of level of difficulty but in terms of uh, let's say level of entrance so so at top of all uh, get even uh, was something that we did before we hoped we will be able to make get even too but after this project was not successful commercially we had to look for some different way of utilizing our skills into some new IP, into something totally different project that could be more commercially viable, that could be more accessible in terms of uh, especially core fantasy, like uh, explaining people what the, what the game is all about. So even if today it's very hard to describe it, even uh, then Chernobylite was like, okay, we are getting the narratives, uh, very good narratives that we did for get even, uh, the way how we use narratives, the way how we use photogrammetry, the way how we try to create a game which is deep and emotional, but then we are wrapping it up in something what is much more, uh, let's say, easy to enter. And what it was, it was something like, let's make a horror game about Chernobyl. Like, it's something that everybody understands and liking it or not, but if you say survival horror in Chernobyl, then you will get to know what you can expect. So, so this is the, the key thing. And the other thing is why Chernobyl? First of all, we have been working on Chernobyl VR project before. It was kind of documentary project. It was kind of VR uh, trip to Chernobyl zone. We have been utilizing both VR and our photogrammetry pipeline to make this. It was more like my personal small project on, on side of the company, big projects because uh, it was finally commercial success, mostly because of Chernobyl team, but we didn't need it uh, for, for the commercial reason. We mostly did it uh, to develop our skills in, in the new technology, to learn Unreal 4, to, to, to learn more about photogrammetry. And then after making this virtual trip to Chernobyl, everybody was asking us in these VR helmets, but 
where are the monsters or how can I shoot here? And we are explaining, no, it's it's not a game. It's just like virtual trip. You can walk around the Chernobyl. Yeah, but I would like to shoot some monsters. So, so then uh, after getting feedback on absolutely every showcase of this uh, project, we decided, okay, so yeah, let's add monsters to Chernobyl. And then we have uh, a way how to make relatively, uh, let's say, uh, marketable game because you got Chernobyl, you got monsters, but what is most important, uh, we uh, tr still tried to keep our own formula within this game. Like we wanted to be focused on narratives. We wanted to be focused on the displaying the beautiful world, to allowing you to transform uh, yourself into somebody who is exploring the Chernobyl zone. It was very important. It was not like, gameplay formula came first it was like story formula came first and and the idea of like you will be exploring the most beautiful recreation of chernobyl zone and having some adventures related to the story at top of it so uh, we added uh, following features like we we work on the combat system we work on the inventory we work on the sort of survival mechanics but they were uh, at some point uh, they were more deri derivative from the fact that we didn't succeed on the formula of previous game, then, then we wanted to create some survival games. So key references for us was, uh, first of all, for the setting, it was Fallout, Metro and Stalker. Actually, uh, it may sound weird, but uh, stronger reference for us was Fallout than Metro and then Stalker, because we are more RPG. Actually, because it is Chernobyl, then everybody is comparing this game to Stalker, but we didn't took uh, basically anything from the Stalker game. Uh, we we knew the game, we played it and we liked it and so on. Uh, but our core idea was more like make first person uh, RPG game like Fallout, just smaller because we are in the team, we are only 30 people. So we knew we will not go for the open world, we will not make a massive game, but still uh, Attaching of uh, attachment of Chernobylite to to Stalker and Metro was more because it's post-apocalyptic, uh, post-Soviet setting. Uh, still, everything else we believe was supposed to be different because for the story, uh, it, we we are always inspired by the uh, horror story games like Silent Hill, and uh, in our uh, eyes. Chernobyl zone was like a silent hill, just in our, on our continent, uh, like abandoned and destroyed and deformed place, which is scary and w where we can f tell a very personal story, which is dark and grim. And in terms of survival mechanics, uh, our key inspiration was this war of mine, meaning uh, the game where you survive by walking in the group, like you are building relationships with your uh, teammates and thanks to this you can survive so so it was like attempt to make a survival game but which is not survival of one person it's survival of the group but still it's not multiplayer game it's like on a single player uh, mechanism it's it's is made by building relationship with other people and trying to survive the radioactive hell so we made a kind of business strategy like we had zero budget for marketing it was very important because uh, we simply were very tight on budget. Most of the project has been funded uh, only thanks to the fact that we organized a granting program for developing our 3D scanning technology. And thanks to this, we got some money to make some technical prototypes and to prototype some gameplay. And then we went for Kickstarter because we needed another, uh, let's say, batch of, of funding. And when Kickstarter was successful, then we went for early access because again, we we needed money. And we also figured out that instead of going for publishers, which I really wanted to avoid because for the previous project, we, we didn't really feel that this kind of indie game can really work with uh, big publishers and for small publishers this project was too big so so we didn't want to go for big publishers even if we had interest from big publishers and we didn't uh, want to go for small publishers because they were simply too small we believe that we can do better uh, community building and selling uh, the game by our own we already had quite experience after selling chernobyl vr project 
uh, on on different platforms. So we believed uh, we want to stay independent and we want to make the game on our own. So so ultimately, the full PC version has been released in July twenty one. And then PS4 X1 was released a few months later. Then this year we had a new generation of consoles released. One of the reasons why we didn't have sim release for all platforms was we are small. Uh, we didn't have production capabilities to work internally on the porting for the console. So for the porting for the consoles, we actually got into deal with publisher. It was all in games. But it was after we basically finished all the development, it was not like control over the project. It was more like supporting us as a publisher. They did localization, they did porting, and, uh, and they helped us a bit on marketing. Uh, it, it was quite okay for us. Uh, so uh, we, from the very beginning, uh, as I mentioned, we had almost zero budget for marketing. We started on trying to deliver the idea of the game and spread it all over the world, knowing that this is a new IP and knowing that we will not teach people about this project, we will not get them involved into the subject, and then we will not be able to make a big marketing campaign just before the game release and, and find the audience then. So we are starting very early, uh, like I was posting photos on Instagram and Facebook uh, from our trips to Chernobyl, and, uh, and, and we have been trying to keep interest from people who were somehow interested in urban exploring, somehow interested in making uh, trips to Chernobyl, somehow interested in, in video games like Stalker, Metro, Fallout, uh, Wastelands and whatever could be post-apocalyptic uh, subject. And uh, then, after having initial round of people interested in us, we started uh, to build community for Kickstarter because we knew that, okay, on Kickstarter it's very hard to... today, I mean, 10 years ago it was uh, more popular to uh, let's say go for Kickstarter and do a successful campaign. Recently, most of the games are not succeeding a lot. So, uh, so uh, we knew that Kickstarter will be hard, but we wanted to give it a try. Anyway, we believed it, it makes sense because by Kickstarter, you are very strongly enhancing your community, not just building a community. Because on Kickstarter, if you got two or three thousand of people supporting you, it's both big number, but uh, but it's nothing comparing what you can go get on other social medias. Just the difference is that on Kickstarter, these people are really committing to your project. Not just they are giving you money, they are really committing. If, if you pay somebody even a tiny amount of money, then you are believing that he is doing something right, and then you keep supporting him in other ways. So many people from Kickstarter were supporting us in different ways. After all, helping us with translation, helping us with promoting our world and so on. So, so we realized by some research that Kickstarter is the strongest community building tool for the project like this, and we use it. And fortunately, we have succeeded. But ultimately, of course, it was not about. Uh, what we can do on Kickstarter is about how we can sell the game. We decided that Steam will be our main platform because we already had some experience with Steam and for PC games, uh, it's, it's obvious that 90% of or even more of sales are coming uh, by the Steam. So uh, we have been targeting all people to go uh, to go to Steam to wishlist the game and to build a strong community again before we release uh, Early Access. And Early Access was released in 2019 uh, quite successfully, not as successfully as we expected looking at the Kickstarter, uh, because on uh, Kickstarter we were the second most funded Polish game on Kickstarter. Uh, I mean, until today, I guess, only Super Hot was more successful than, uh, than Chernobylite. Uh, we have reach quite reasonable money. It was not big comparing to our budget because we collected like 200 uh, something thousand of dollars. Uh, I don't remember exactly. It was not very massive amount of money, but it was good to keep us alive for another, uh, let's say, half a year or, or, or something like this until early access it could happen. We we have gathered a lot of wish lists uh, on during Kickstarter, Kickstarter campaign because we're combining everything together. Like Kickstarter is targeting people to Steam because ultimately 
uh, even if somebody didn't support us on Kickstarter, we hope that if they like what we are doing, they will support us by going to early access. So early access was, as I mentioned, quite successful. Uh, we had been listed as the best 2019 Steam new releases. We sold during whole uh, early access, we sold like 150,000 of copies. It was in year and a half until 2021 when we have released the full version, but we had some uh, issues with that that I will mention uh, in a moment. Uh, we gathered feedback about uh, what players liked and what they didn't like on the game and it was the best thing coming out from the early access. Uh, like this, actually this, this uh, survey was done at the end of early access, it was not during early access because we have been doing several surveys during early access. We have been first of all monitoring on Steam, all Steam forums and uh, all our social media, talking with people what's good, what's wrong and so on, but uh, ultimately we were shaping the game, like one and a half year of being in early access was about shaping the game, following players' feedback and obviously we didn't do anything that players wanted us to do, like we were not adding co-op or multiplayer, like many people were asking for it, but we are simply not capable of doing it. But talking about small design decision, talking about level of difficulty, talking about polish, we did a lot. So we had production challenges. First of all, entry point uh, was putting us at the very hard position to start new project because we had very tiny budgets. We had small team because most of the people from our team had to move to other uh, team in our company to make other projects because of lack of success or get even. Uh, we were switching to Unreal Engine, which was kind of painful uh, because we had to learn new technology. And Kickstarter and Early Access was kind of production hell because we had to spend a lot of efforts of, uh, on not just making the game, but supporting uh, what's going on around the game, like uh, replying to bugs, like fixing the game, making patches, uh, doing localization. Localization process was a mess because uh, it's very hard to do localization until you finish the game. You can realize that if it's for story-based game, when story is evolving, if you are releasing early access and then you change something in the story, you need to rewrite uh, all language versions of the game. And it was very, very hard and painful. Uh, so basically uh, QA, meaning testing the game and uh, budget and uh, photogrammetry and trips to the zone was the separate issue uh, that uh, that we had a lot of to deal with, but still we have achieved something like quality production values were higher than in our previous projects. And I believe among others, it was uh, because of, uh, let's say, get, get, getting to early access and uh, being very focused on player feedback and, and being very focused on dealing with our community. We have, go we have gone through massive design transformation because originally this game was supposed to be Get Even 2 and ultimately it became survival horror with totally different gameplay mechanics. Uh, we did quite effective marketing and we built an original IP which is uh, supposed to, to be, let's say, expanded. In the future, uh, we have kept independence, like we have been able to uh, still do what we believe is the best for us, not not to follow up anybody uh, orders we have released the game for five platforms what is also a, a big achievement even if i need to say without the publisher at the final stage it would not be possible to do so and we almost kept the time and budget uh, that was assumed uh, on the very beginning mostly because we were very limited and we knew we have to push we knew we have to keep deadlines we knew uh, we, we don't have money to waste on anything so we are very cautious about what we are we be doing, but we have also failed on on few times. And to not expand it uh, much higher, I can just few tell few words about this. Like prototyping and initial design phase was very long because originally we believed, okay, we can make the game like Get Even, just better on the new technology. Then it appeared that Get Even failed, so we need to rework everything. And uh, we had a lot of hiccups on on organization of of pre production and initial design. Uh, localization process, as I mentioned, was to fail mostly because we decided that for early access we want to have game localized for several languages. We thought, okay, 
we'll get some translators from the community. On the Kickstarter, we have many people who are willing us to help. Uh, so uh, we believed, okay, we, we will be able to handle localization even if the game will be updated many times. But then it appeared that cycles of localization for the game which is heavy in story and we are changing the story and we need to reiterate the localization, not just reiterate the main script of the game was always pain in the ass and it costed us a lot of trouble and it affected, uh, in some cases it affected uh, a translation quality for different languages. We had problems with audio production, mostly because we had no experienced audio designer during whole production of the game, simply uh, the guy who was working uh, with us on Get Even left uh, and, uh, and we were working only with junior audio designers and right now they became experienced audio designers, but back in time uh, it costed us a lot of technical problem. We got problem with optimization because we have been doing quite open and quite big locations comparing to what we have done before and we have been using PBR material system for, for 3D assets. And we, and generally our game was supposed to look beautiful and, and high end. So, so optimization was a big issue and it costed us again, a lot of uh, problems, including me for six months, switching from other activities to just uh, sitting in the engine and optimizing the, the assets. Uh, we tried to incorporate classic marketing activities like paid, paid advertisement, like working with publisher on on uh, their way of using agencies for social media and I consider it a fail because if you are Indian, if you are uh, talking directly to the people, then you cannot immediately switch to uh, showing people paid advertisement. They simply are not buying it. So we quit on paid advertisement and we are still doing uh, regular social activities by our own as the creators, not, not using any paid, uh, paid stuff. And of course, we had some quality issues. The game is not that polished as, as we wanted it to be. And it had, it still had some technical issues even a year after final release. But thanks to early access, we have fixed most of the issues during the uh, development. So it was not like we are using the game, which is broken. Uh, fortunately, this game is, is stable, is optimized and is working well, even, of the, even on the old computers. We had frictions between sub teams like uh, in every project, uh, when the size and scope of the team is dynamic, so, so programmers are not willing to work with designers and designers have problems with artists and so on and so on. We have been fighting a bit too much, in my opinion, there was a bit too much of fighting between some of the teams, but ultimately we were always finding a solution how to satisfy, let's say, the needs of all the teams, but it was not smooth process, I can only say. And because of different reasons, until the very last moment of the production, we didn't have the complete team. Like we knew we, we, want, we need to have this amount of animators, this amount of programmers, this amount of graphic artists. It was all, let's say, well uh, defined in the budget, in the scope of the project and so on. Just by the very end of the project, we never completed the whole team. We never had uh, expected amount of programmers and animators, for instance. Uh, we had to to do things like one guy was both programmer and animator. Me, I was marketing guy and I was a technical, uh, let's say, director doing optimization of the game and so on and so on. It wasn't bad. I'm just saying that we were expecting a bit more, but because of HR issues, because of budget, budget issues, because of other company issues, we were not able to build the final team. And believing in Russia was that uh, last but not least, uh, we believed in the Russian market and we believe that this game can be good for uh, people, not just from Ukraine, but, but also from the other Russian speaking territories. But then the war appeared and today we are not just not supporting uh, anymore, let's say, players from Russian market and we are not selling uh, this game directly to, to this market. We uh, simply decided that for the next game, uh, if it will be located in the same setting, we'll be also using Ukrainian language instead of Russian, because it's not just about uh, the war issue. I, I just give you the example. Uh, when we have been releasing uh, early access version in 2019, I was pushing that uh, the story is about political fiction, like warning, uh, Russia invaded whole Ukraine. And it was like in 2019, 
it was it was kind of political fiction, at least for most of the people. For me, not because I was in Ukraine so many times before, and I was in Donetsk, Donbas, Lugansk in 2016. I have been doing documentary about the war, so I knew it may happen, and I did this. And what happened after we released the game with Russian army invading uh, Ukraine? It was like backlash from Russian players. It was like review bombing. It was like buying our game just to make negative reviews and uh, return it back, and so on. And and our sales were decreasing, our reviews on Steam were decreasing, and then I asked my Ukrainian consultants what to do about this. And they said, okay, do you really care that this is a Russian, Russian army? And I said, well, no, I just needed, uh, you know, some soldiers in Chernobyl zone. So let's change the Russian army uh, into mercenaries. And I will say, okay, if you say so. It, it, just to mention, it was Ukrainian people telling me, to, we don't need to be that rude on Russians, maybe let's not, uh, not, not provoke them in this way. And I said, okay, we have changed few, few lines in the story that this is not a Russian army, this is an army of mercenaries, and then Russians stopped to harass us about uh, these facts. And, and, but, but the funny and not funny thing is that I get to know about the war in Ukraine, that on 24 of February of this year, I received SMS from our writer like, yeah, we were right. Russian invaded Chernobyl because it was the first place they entered uh, in Ukraine. So, so I'm just saying that it's not today about uh, complaining uh, how Russia is bad or not. We we all know what to think about this, but but I'm just saying that uh, we put a, a bit too much attention to to this market. At least on business perspective, it was bad, and on a moral perspective, we also believe it was bad. So. Our next game will be definitely shaped in a bit different way regarding this subject. So that's all. I guess I almost reached my time. We got like one minute. Uh, if you got any question, we can uh, we can still talk a bit. Okay. So I have a question. Uh, with your games and your projects, do you try to encourage players to play a game with some specific atmosphere, with some perhaps bright emotions like terror, like, I don't know, sudden screamers, or you dedicate more times to create some interesting mechanics, some interesting gameplay to attract players all around the world? So what do you prefer, some bright emotions or some interesting gameplay? Either, ideally, I would say everything uh, as is, impo is as important because uh, the game, immersive game, uh, should not be divided for gameplay mechanics, for story, for atmosphere. So it should be all, you know, flawless. But it's ideal. <laughs> and uh, get even was almost like this. We didn't do it perfectly, but we did get even in this way. But with Chernobyl, the thing was that we had to change these things, and and they were not really working on parallelly because we kept the atmosphere, we kept the focus on the story and on the deep emotions and on the grim atmosphere and so on. But on the other side, in the meantime, we have been reworking uh, gameplay mechanics a lot. So I believe finally we managed to patch everything together to, to give you good experience, but uh, it's not like matter of making priorities. Uh, I, I could say we, we had more time and better attitude in this project to uh, make uh, atmosphere and visuals and, and music uh, properly from the beginning and the gameplay mechanics were evolving a lot. So this is why I believe this game is still better on atmosphere and overall feelings than, than on gameplay mechanics. Uh, and this is how, how it comes from feedback. Fortunately, most of the players say, but the gameplay mechanics are also good. I see. Okay, thank you. So it's a Uh, I cannot say how important they are now because uh, today we don't have much of activities regarding uh, toward building wish list. But I believe it's not about just the amount of wish lists, but it's about you need to target people somewhere because people live in so many social medias today that we are thinking about. It's not just wish list; it's just Steam. Steam is our social media because ultimately we'll be selling game there. You know, all the social medias around Steam, as as we called it, like Instagram, Facebook, Reddit, whatever else, they what, they only can bring people to Steam, but they they will not make these people buy the game. So so our goal, our sneaky goal was, okay, we treat all social medias uh, around to 
as an ignition to bring people to Steam. And on Steam, we are using Steam actually as a social medium. Like even now, we are weekly posting the report what's going on in the team, not just as an event, you know, just, just to promote the game on certain moment. We simply do regular posting on Steam as a social medium. We are getting followers, we are talking with them, we are active on forums. And then in result, we got uh, big amount of wishes, but uh, but I believe it was uh, amount of wishes was a result of what we are doing, not not the the goal itself. Although I had to use the wishes many times to convince, especially the board of the company and investors, that yeah, you know, it's high enough, so people will buy our game because otherwise I would have no argument to uh, to keep running this project and it would be suspended or, or even cancelled in some point, if if not good wishes. So so I would say good wish list uh, was good and it's still working out right now like we got much more than a million of uh, remaining wishes and people we see like half of the sales are coming from wishes so so thanks to building very high wish list we are still selling the game relatively good but uh, i would not judge the wish list itself is uh, is the k goal or is it's uh, securing you uh, the way of making good business any other question Okay, guys, so thank you very much for your attention. Happy to be here and see you next year, I hope, in Kiev. <laughs>